Hi, it's Brian Timoney here and uh, welcome on to today's show. Now, I hope you've had a good week and uh, you've been out there, been very industrious on the acting front. And um, we've got some really interesting questions and there's a really good one coming up about um, audition pieces. And as we know, additions are very important in an actor's life. So let's get to that first question. Is an audition piece better from something you've seen? And does obscurity help when choosing? The poly. When it comes to performing an audition piece, it's probably better that you have not seen the actual piece you're going to do. Um, the reasons for that is that when you watch another actor perform the piece, you kind of unconsciously thereafter uh, remember that performance. And if you do something different unconsciously, you might start to think that you're doing it incorrectly or differently or wrongly. Um, so it's better that you start with something that you have never seen, if possible. Now, I know that's not always possible, but if you can, that's the ideal. Um, obscurity is good when it comes to audition pieces. Um, the reason being that is the audition panels, they, they are watching um, actors, you know, one after the other do audition pieces. And there's some pieces that are quite well known or iconic even, and they, they hear them over and over again. So it's best to surprise the audition panel if you can with something that maybe they haven't heard before or haven't seen before. And that way, you, that automatically wakes them up as well because they're already thinking, I don't know what this is and I'm going to watch and really engage in what's going on. Um, also, I would veer away from anything too iconic. Um, and really, you know, audition pieces are requested for theatre mostly. Very, very rare that you would ever be asked to do an audition piece for um, a film project, for example. Um, so primarily, it'll always be for theatre that you would do an audition piece. Um, but just make sure that you don't do something that is so associated one, with one particular actor or something that's so ingrained into the psyche as a whole that people find it very difficult to get it out of their heads. I'll give you an example. Um, I had to play the lead role in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Now, in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, generally speaking, people have that image of Jack Nicholson in their mind playing that role. So you have to be aware of that and you have to look, if you have to do a role like that, you have to look at how you're going to make it different from the person who played it. But like I say, if you've got the option, just don't bother getting involved in that. Find something that's completely different, maybe a little bit obscure that people haven't heard of and, um, and surprise them. I mean, audition pe people like to be surprised. So, um, so I think that answers that question. Let's go on to the next one. What's the best way to learn different accents and memorise a long monologue? Maleficent Martini. Okay, so how do you learn uh, an accent? This is a good question because at some point in your career as an actor, you're going to have to do a different accent. I'm quite sure at some point you're going to have to do this. Um, so how do you learn it? How do you get to the point where you can pull off a, a great accent flawlessly? Well, you may have noticed that I do a very good Scottish accent. In fact, I, I'm from Glasgow and I have a flawless Glaswegian accent. So how did I learn this accent? Well, there's a couple of things that, that happened while I was growing up. The first thing is I, was I grew up in Glasgow, so I was around people that spoke in that accent all of the time. My parents spoke in that accent. Everybody that I, I was coming into contact spoke in that accent. So a good thing to do as an actor is if you can, go to the area where they talk in, in that particular accent and uh, being around it, you start to pick up more and more of it. The other thing that you pick up that is not as obvious as just the sound of the accent is the attitude behind the accent. Um, because with every accent, there's an attitude, there's a history, there's a culture behind it. And being amongst that, you start to pick up all of those things as well. Um, what else, you know, how else did I get my perfect Glaswegian accent? Um, well, I practiced it every day from, you know, since a child, I've been speaking in this Glaswegian accent and I've practiced it every day. So the other thing that you have to do is that when you're working on an accent, do it every day. Make sure that you are, um, it becomes part of you and needs to become second nature. And the only way it will become second nature is if you're doing it over and over and over again. Um, there's some other things that you can do to help this process. You could go to an accent coach. There's particular coaches that just specialize in doing accents and they could help you with that. Um, the other thing you could do is that you could get um, tapes, accent tapes, or as they probably call these days, MP3s, right? Accent MP3s where you can listen to that accent, try and replicate it, and really build up your understanding of how the accent works. 
So um, that's what I recommend that you do. The other thing that you can add into this as well is when you're practicing the accent, tape yourself on a, a voice recorder. Don't particularly do it visually, just, just your voice so that you can hear how close you are getting to the accent because sometimes you think that you may be getting very close to it, but now and again, there'll be a, a sound from your, your own accent that slips in. And it might be the same sound, it often is, by the way, the same vowel sound uh, that starts to creep in because it's just one that you're very familiar with. So by recording yourself and listening to it back, you'll hear that and then you can start to address it and you can start to amend it. So there we go, that's how I think uh, you should deal with accents. Now, this long monologue situation, how do you deal with that? Well, whether it's a long monologue or a long script, anything that you've got to learn, what you should do is immerse yourself in it and read it over and over again. So instead of thinking about, I've got to learn this, this monologue and you jump straight into learning it line by line, forget about that. Just read it over and over and over again. Once you've read it a hundred times, unconsciously some of that, that material, some of the lines will have gone in. So um, it makes it easier to learn the lines as well in the long run. So once you've read it over and over again, maybe for a few weeks, if you've got that sort of length of time, then you start to learn it line by line. And basically that's just a case of looking at the line, covering that line up, trying to say it out loud, go back and check, did you get it right or wrong? And then moving on to the next line. Um, so that's how I think you should deal with uh, long monologues. Okay, let's go to the next question. What techniques work to produce consistent emotion on demand? David. Okay, so how do you produce emotion on demand? This is a really good question because it's really at the heart of the, one of the major challenges that actors have because, you know, an actor is very different from other artists, you know, because it, the actor has to produce emotion at a certain point. You know, when action is called on set or when the curtain rises in the theatre, that is when the actor must and has to produce emotion each and every time. Now, the problem is, how do you do that consistently? Well, um, there's a thing called affective memory and um, also referred to as emotional memory, which really came about um, through the work of several people, but it started with a man called Pavlov. And Pavlov was a psychologist and uh, he was carrying out some interesting experiments. And what he did was that he fed his dogs at the same time each day. Um, but when he fed his dogs, he put on a white lab coat and he rang a little bell. And he wanted to see how they reacted to this. And when he he put the lab coat on and rang the little bell, he would produce the food. And the dogs used to come running and they would see the food and they would, you know, eat all of the food. And they got used to this. But he did this every day for six months. Put the coat on, rang the bell, the dogs came. Then after six months, he decided that he wasn't going to produce the food, but he put the coat on and he rang the bell. Guess what happened? The dogs came running. They were really excited. They were salivating. They were still having this emotional reaction. But it wasn't to the food, it was to the, the lab coat and the bell. And he said in the end, actually, they would just respond to him putting on the lab coat. They got really excited at that. So here's the thing was he made this connection between the senses and uh, an emotional uh, reaction. And then a guy came along called Konstantin Stanislavski and he saw the work that Pavlov was doing. And he thought, this is interesting. This could really work for actors. He said, if we could get dogs to react in this way, couldn't we get human beings to do it? In fact, maybe we could get them to react in much more complicated ways because obviously the human brain is capable of much more thought. So what he did was he trained his actors um, to use sense and emotional memory. And what they did was that they recalled experiences from their past through their senses. So they would um, remember the sound of a piece of music or they would, the sound of somebody's voice or the look of somebody's eye um, from an experience in their past. And they would relive that moment to produce the emotion that was required for the scene they were about to do. Now, there's an important thing for you to note here is that emotional memory, the idea behind it is to get you into the scene. So once you're in the scene and you're actually working, the, the sense memory's done its job and it will leave of its own accord. But it's really a, a preparation tool to get you into the right emotional state to do the scene. Because what, you, what you've got to remember is that when you're in a scene, it's too late to generate something at that point. Really, you have to have it at the start. 
you know, when you're going into, when action is called, do you have that emotion to give at that point? Now, I know it may change as the scenes progress or the, the play progresses, but at the start, when you begin, you have to have something to give. It has to be consistent. It really must be consistent. Because could you imagine any other job that you turn up to and you couldn't consistently produce a professional result? Now, for example, you know, say you had a problem with your kitchen, yet your sink is blocked up. You phone the plumber, the plumber comes out, looks at your blank block sink and goes, uh, I'm not really sure whether I can do this today or not. I'm not really sure if I can, I've got the tools to unblock this today. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. Now, what would you say to that individual? You'd say, look, forget it, I'm gonna phone somebody else. That's kind of what happens in acting, is that you have to be able to consistently produce that result. It shouldn't be a hit and miss event, for some actors it is, but it shouldn't be because this tool allows you to, to make sure that that never happens. So it requires a lot of practice, it requires a lot of commitment and dedication because I know I've told you, well, you think about experiences from your past through your senses and therefore that will produce emotion. It's not quite as simple as that. It's something that requires a lot of um, dedication, commitment, and you have to learn it properly. Um, because the danger is if you don't, it will be inconsistent. You know, it's, what I've just explained to you is like a theory in a way. You can apply that theory, but without the rigor behind that theory, without the practical dedication and commitment to it, it will never be consistently, um, you know, good. You know, and that's really what we're looking for. So I think that really covers it. It's the tool that will make your performance consistent emotionally is effective memory. It's really recalling emotions, um, not emotions, but experiences from your past that will produce the correct emotion for the scene. So that's what I recommend that you do. Um, so there we go. I think that brings us to the end of this show. We've covered a lot on this show, emotional memory and all kinds of things. So go ahead and uh, put that into practice. Maybe there's some of this that you can do right away. Right, if you want to send me in a question, I'm sure you must have lots of questions that you need answering. Um, there's several ways that you can do that. You can send it in via Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, email me, or send in a video of you asking the question. That'd be great. Go ahead and do that, and I look forward to speaking to you on the next show.